consider the polyhedron drawn in two dimensions here. There are four maximal proper phases of this polyhedron. Here is one of them, and here is another. Here is a third one, and here is a fourth one. Now it seems that if you take a look this closely, in order to define the polyhedron, we have to include an inequality that induces each of these phases. For example, there doesn't seem to be a way for us to avoid an inequality that looks like this. And the same for each of these three other phases. Now let's take a look at this polytope here. It's basically a line segment. In order to define this polytope using inequalities, we first need inequalities that define the line this line segment lies on, but we also need inequalities that basically stop the ends from extending further, something like this. But there doesn't seem to be a unique way to pick such an inequality. For example, I can as well pick this inequality, and that will stop this line from extending further. And by unique, we allow non-negative scalar multiples of the inequality to denote the same inequality. So what's the difference between these two polytopes? The one on the right has dimension 2, whereas the one on the left has dimension 1. It turns out that a polyhedron in Rn with dimension n, which is called full dimensional, has some really nice properties, and they are completely defined by their facets. So what is a facet? If phase f of a polyhedron p is a facet, if the dimension of f is one less than the dimension of the polyhedron. Let a transpose x greater than or equal to beta be a valid inequality for the polyhedron p. We say that this inequality is facet defining if it induces a facet of p. So for our example here, an inequality that looks like this is facet defining. A polyhedron p in Rn is full dimensional if the dimension of p is equal to n. Clearly, n is the largest possible value for the dimension of any polyhedron. So there are a couple of nice facts about full dimensional polyhedra. Suppose that p is a full dimensional polyhedron given in this form. Now, if one of these inequalities is non-redundant, in other words, removing the inequality will no longer define p, then this inequality is actually facet defining. Another fact is, if all the inequalities defining p here are non-redundant, and if you take any facet of p, then that facet is actually induced by one of these inequalities. Combining these facts, what we can say is that if p is defined by a minimal system of inequalities, and if p is full dimensional, then each inequality must be facet defining, and for every facet of p, we'll have an inequality that induces it. Therefore, a minimal defining system is uniquely determined by the facet defining inequalities, up to scalar multiples. We're now going to give a sketch of the proof of the first fact. The fact that this inequality is non-redundant means that there is an element in Rn that violates this but satisfies all the remaining inequalities. Now, because p is four-dimensional, we can find a point in p that satisfies all these inequalities strictly. So let's look at a sketch of what is happening here. So suppose this is my inequality ak transpose x squared and equal to beta k, and we will have other inequalities defining p. So our u will be somewhere here, and our z will be somewhere here. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the intersection of the line segment between u and z with the boundary of the half space defined by this inequality. And we'll call this point x prime. So x prime is the intersection of the line segment between u and z with the hyperplane defined by this equation. Now, x prime is in p because it satisfies all the inequalities. Also, x prime satisfies these inequalities. That's because z satisfies all of these strictly, and u satisfies all of these. Now what we're going to do is, we're going to show that the phase induced by this inequality has dimension n minus 1. And we'll do this by construction. Because if you look at this picture here, there's some room to move around on the boundary 
of the half space defined by this inequality. And the directions in which we can move in are precisely the null space of AK transpose. So we're going to let D1 up to DL be a basis for the null space of AK transpose. And here L is going to be N minus 1 because this is a rank 1 matrix. Now, if we look at these vectors where epsilon is positive, if epsilon is sufficiently small, all these will lie in P and they are finitely independent. In fact, these vectors all lie in the phase induced by this inequality. Since they are finitely independent and they are n of them, the phase induced by this inequality must have dimension n-1, and so the phase must be a facet of P.